let us start at looking at certain mobile radio propagation mechanisms in greater detail in today's lecture. The outline of today's lecture is as follows. First, we will start with summarizing what we have learnt already in the domain of radio propagation mechanisms. Then, we will revisit free space propagation model, because it is still valid in many applications and it forms the basis for other models. Then, we will look at something very interesting called small scale propagation model, followed by large scale propagation model. Then, we will look at a log distance path loss model. It is very important in urban areas. And finally, log normal shadowing, which is a more realistic model. So, today's lecture will focus on various kinds of models and their applications. But first, let us recap what we have done already. In the previous lectures, we have looked at reflection models, that is, when a ray travels from the transmitter to the receiver, it may re get reflected from various reflectors. Now, these reflectors could be metallic or dielectric. These two depend on what kind of material is being used. For example, you could have a sharp corner reflector from a window frame, which is metallic or brick, which is a dielectric. So, if it is a metallic reflector, you will get almost all the energy reflected back. Whereas, if you are having a dielectric as a reflector, part of the energy will be absorbed. Reflections form an important method for propagation and remember, it is also used to illuminate regions, which normally do not have proper signal strength. The other method is diffraction, where you do not have a clear line of sight. However, you can still get certain radiations by Huygens principle. We looked at the single knife edge diffraction geometry and also multiple knife edges diffraction geometry last time. Then finally, we have the scattering model, which will become important in the urban scenarios, where even though you do not have a line of sight, you get a lot of energy simply by scattering. All these things can be measured and lot of empirical propagation models are based on measurements. Lastly, we also saw certain scenarios of radio propagation mechanisms, wherein we saw reflection, diffraction and scattering happening all at the same time. In today's class, we will learn more in detail about these as well as the direct line of sight propagation. Continuing with the recap of sorts, we will remember that the need for propagation model is important because it helps to determine the coverage area of a transmitter. One of the important factors which tells us how large is your cell size is the link budget, okay? the budget for the received power. Now, if we have a good propagation model, I can accurately predict what will be the size of my cell, if it is limited by the signal power. So, it determines the transmit power requirements and also in effect determines the battery lifetime. So, when I design my system, if I take it into account a proper propagation model, then I can actually optimize my cell life. The other interesting thing is, it helps us predict what is the appropriate modulation and coding schemes that can be deployed in order to improve the channel quality. This is important, because if I have a propagation model that is pessimist, it does not predict very good signal strength available at a certain area, we would deploy lower modulation schemes. Consider MLE digital modulation schemes and we would probably go in for BPSK, because we think that the signal strength is weak and so signal to interference or signal to noise ratio will be poor and so to get the desired quality of service, let us go with BPSK or at most QPSK. Whereas, if your channel model and the propagation model was more accurate, you would have probably received more signal strength as per prediction and deployed 
may be 16 QAM or other higher modulation schemes, thereby increasing your data rate. So, the design perspective must take into consideration a correct, accurate propagation model if has to design the system. Now, let us revisit free space propagation model. We have seen this before, but it is important to emphasize on certain components of this free space propagation model. Clearly, this is used to predict the received signal strength in the case when there is a clear line of sight between the transmitter and receiver. Now, many times we have indoor communication requirements wherein the transmitter and receiver do have a clear line of sight. In mobile communication where we use cell phones, really many times you do not have. So, this free space propagation model will not hold. However, for example, satellite communications, we do require a clear line of sight and hence this free space model will work. So, it has its own applications. Now, consider a realistic situation where I have a transmitter a base station antenna and a receiver antenna which is at a distance d and let us assume that they do have a clear of line of sight. In this scenario, we are not using the two path reflection model. Remember, last time we also looked at the ground reflection model wherein not only a direct line of sight ray will come, but one from a reflected, uh, reflected from the ground will also appear at the receiver. In that case, our received strength will determine will be determined by the transmitter height and the receiver height. Here, free space propagation model, no reflections. That is the first simplistic case. So, the received power as we know is nothing but transmit power P t times the gain of the transmit antenna G t, gain of the received antenna G r, lambda squared which is the wavelength squared, whole divided by phi. 4 pi r, 4 pi squared, d squared, l, where d is the distance between the transmitter and receiver. We know this is called the freeze free space equation. Now, the l is the system loss factor which is not related to propagation. We will soon see that this l encompasses couple of other things as well. Let us spend a little bit more time on this equation and dissect it and see how the different parameters make a difference, especially the lambda, the d and the l. So, this is our freeze free space equation and let us focus our attention on the d squared, d being the distance between the transmitter and receiver. So, clearly the power falls as a square of the transmitter receiver separation and received power decays with distance at the rate of 20 dB per decade. Very soon, we will realize that all the loss used in the literature is expressed in decibels. On the right hand side, you see a lot of products and divisions. If we use the dB scale 10 log to the base 10 p r, then we will have all of the right side as summations and subtractions. So, dB scale is normally used to depict the received power as well as the path loss. Here, we are expressing the received power as 20 dB per decade. Let us go on again the freeze free space model, but this time let us look at this L, because we are not tweaking with the transmit power P t, the gain of the transmitter G t or gain of the receiver G r. So, L which is the propagation loss in the channel is expressed as L p times L s times L f and what are these? Well, they are very interesting parameters. L f is fast fading. We will look at it very soon in the subsequent slides. L s is slow fading. So, this phenomenon of fading will be discussed and L p is the actual path loss. Now, we have seen for the freeze equation to hold, the distance d should be in the far field of the transmit antenna. 
So, it does not hold very close to your base station as we have seen. Now, what is this far field? The far field or the Fraunhofer region of a transmitting antenna is defined as the region beyond the far field distance d f which is given by d f is equal to 2 d squared over lambda where capital D is the largest physical dimension of the antenna. So, really the largest physical dimension also depends on the wavelength that we are going to use. So, d f is really dependent on the wavelength also. You can say d f is normalized with respect to wavelength. Additionally, we should have d f much much greater than capital D the largest dimension of the antenna and d f much much greater than lambda. Clearly, a few meters or so in the GSM band will take you to the far field. So, your equation will hold good beyond 5 meters or so. Now, we know that the equation does not hold good for d is equal to 0. For this reasons, models use a close in distance d 0 as the receiver power reference point. Now, d 0 should be greater than this d f, so that the near field effects do not interfere. d 0 should be smaller than any practical distance a mobile system uses. So, this is a reference distance and we can talk about any other received power strength at a farther distance with respect to this d 0 distance. d 0 for practical systems could be from 1 meter in indoor environment to 100 meters to 1 kilometer for outdoor environments. What does this mean? That I can take a measurement and find out the power at a distance d 0 at 1 meter from the transmit antenna and with respect to that we can find out all other distances. We have to go through this exercise because your freeze free space equation does not hold good in the near field region. Okay. For outdoor environments we go from 100 meters up to 1 kilometer as a place where you have taken the measurement of power and then you can predict based on this near uh, close in prediction distance uh, strength what is the received strength at a farther distance. The received power at any arbitrary distance in the far field p r of d is given by p r d 0 the measured distance times d 0 over d whole squared. So, which is giving you a notion of the squared law the inverse squared law that you get. Power level in dBm is defined as the received power with respect to 1 milliwatt and again we have started putting everything in log. So, you have a dBm with respect to a milliwatt of power. A quick example, a transmitter that produces 50 watts of power, if the d 0 is 100 meters that is we take a power meter, put it at 100 meters and measure the signal strength and the signal strength suppose comes out to be 0 0.0035 milliwatts. We are asked to predict what could be the receiver power level at a distance of 10 kilometers. Suppose your cell radius is 10 kilometers and one of your mobile stations is situated at the fringe, we would like to know what is the received power. So, we use the equation P r d is equal to P r d 0 times d 0 over d whole squared. We substitute the values, do some basic calculations and we get 3.5 into 10 to the power minus 10 watts. We are not comfortable in expressing things in watts, so why not put it with respect to 1 milliwatt of power and in dBm it comes as minus 64.5 dBm. This is not too bad because your GSM phone receiver sensitivity can be as low as minus 100 dBm, so it will still work just gives you a feel of how weak powers can still be useful and you can actually calculate the received power at any distance provided you have a measured power. 
So, this is a very simple model, but a useful model. Now, the path loss that we are talking about actually represents the signal attenuation period. It is typically expressed in dB. It is simply the difference between the effective transmit power and the receive power. So, path loss in dB is log 10 Pt over Pr, which is nothing but minus 10 log the free, free space equation g t g r lambda square divided by 4 pi squared d square. If you go ahead and take g t and g r equal to 1, so unit gain of the transmitter and receiver, then you can have the path loss in d b in terms of a summation and this comes from choosing 4 pi squared here and then in terms of the frequency and the distance. So, this distance 20 log to the base 10 d in kilometer will give you the path loss in d p. So, these numbers have been normalized with respect to frequency in megahertz and distance in kilometers. This equation is useful for predicting the path loss for mobile communication systems something to be noted, the frequency of operation is important. If you have a higher frequency, you have a higher path loss. So, as we go into higher and higher frequency bands, the loss is greater. So, higher frequency means higher loss. Question? Just ignored and we are considering the yes, the question being asked is, is this the ideal situation where we are not looking at interference or reflection or scattering? Is that the question? Yes, it is just the ideal situation, not even the ground reflection is being taken place. So, this will be perfectly valid for satellite communication for example, but in real life also it can be ok. So, I can use it to come up with the first level calculation to predict the receiver strength for mobile communication systems. So, can we measure the tolerance percentage like the plus or minus this much value? Are you asking whether we can predict the tolerance yeah. with respect to the scattering effect and all? Yeah. No, what is done is this model is too simplistic even to take into consideration the basic scattering reflection or diffraction there is no amount of tolerance that can be added to this basic equation to make it good enough for a model that takes into account the scattering or the diffraction or the reflection effects. For that, we need different models. Now, how are those models derived? Well, they can be either based on measurements and curve fitting or some theoretical analytical work. So, we will briefly look at such models also, but no matter how much tolerance you add to this, you cannot account for reflection, scattering or diffraction here. Okay. Now, we would like to have signal models that characterize the signal strength received at the receiver after undergoing reflections, diffractions and scattering and they have to be different from that simplistic model we have been talking about for so long. But what is interesting is reflection, diffraction and scattering happen in two distinct manners depending upon the relative location of the transmitter and receiver, the actual number of reflectors present, how dense is the reflection environment and how dense is the scattering environment. So, we characterize by saying that there could be a small scale propagation model as well as a large scale propagation model we will define these two models separately. Radio propagation models can be derived either by using empirical methods that is you collect measurement data and finally, fit curves to it. A lot of this measurement campaigns were done where you take a power meter in a moving vehicle, move around the city in predetermined grid locations, take the measurements 
plot the curves, try to do some curve fitting and figure out what could be the good propagation model. They are realistic, you do it in density environment, uh, rural environments, vegetative environments and unequal terrain environments. Or you have another choice, you use analytical methods where model the propagation mechanisms themselves mathematically and derive equations for the path loss. Both the models are used, sometimes a mix is used. Let us now consider small scale propagation models. What are small scale propagation models? As the mobile moves over small distances, the instantaneous received signal will fluctuate rapidly, giving rise to small scale fading. Please note that we are talking about small distances and when I say small, it has to be small with respect to the lambda. The reason for this quick fluctuations is that the signal is actually the sum of many contributions coming from different directions, either from reflections or diffractions or scattering. I do not know how, but the bottom line is I am getting at the same time multiple copies of what I sent, but delayed in time and different in phase. Since the phases of these signals are random, and they are truly random, you can assume them to have a uniform distribution between 0 and 2 pi. The sum of all these different components actually behaves noise like. So, one of the ways to model them, it is a random variable, it could be modeled as Rayleigh fading. In small scale fading, the received signal power may change as much as 3 to 4 orders of magnitude, that is 30 to 40 dB, when the receiver is only moved a fraction of the wavelength. What does this imply? This has serious repercussions on your handoff strategy. You should not hand off simply because you are in a fade. Fade is a region where suddenly you receive a lot less power simply because the vector sum of the various reflections and scattering components add up to a very low value. So, I should not hand off simply because I am sitting in a fade, because somehow the small scale fading has resulted in a very low received power. Now, what is interesting to note is only when the receiver moves a fraction of the wavelength or at most a wavelength, it gets out of fade. That means, tomorrow if I have the luxury to put two transmit antennas or vice versa to receive antennas, one antenna might be in fade, then necessarily the other antenna may not be in fade. I have achieved received diversity. I can combine the signals and then I will be able to overcome fading. Continuing with small scale propagation models and some of the characteristics of small scale propagation model. It depends on the small transmitter receiver separation distance changes, a few wavelengths. It is typical of the urban areas which is heavily populated in terms of buildings, scatterers, strong reflectors, etcetera. The mo main propagation mechanism is scattering. Multiple copies of the transmitted signals arriving at the transmitted via received paths and at different time delays add vectorially at the receiver and this results in fading. The distribution of the signal attenuation constant could be either Rayleigh distributed or Rishian distributed depending upon whether you have a line of sight or not. So, if you have a lot of scattered components, but no line of sight then the attenuation coefficients can be effectively modeled as really distributed. However, in addition to that, if you also have a line of sight, you can get something called as a Rishian distribution. So, this is the short term fading model and rapid and severe signal fluctuations usually happen around a slowly 
varying mean. We will soon look at an example where we will see rapid fluctuation over a slowly varying mean. The other part is the large scale propagation models as opposed to the small scale propagation model. Let us see what is a large scale propagation model. As the mobile moves away from the transmitter over large distances, the local average of the received signal will gradually decrease. Note we are talking about a local average. This model still takes into account reflectors, but this is valid not for dense uh, reflections or dense scattering environments. So, you will have slight variations, but we are talking about the local average. This is called large scale fading. Typically, the local average received power is computed by averaging the signal measurements over a measurement track and that can range from 5 wavelengths up to 40 wavelengths. This translates to about 1 meter to 10 meter track for personal communication services. What does it mean? If I have to come up with an appropriate large scale propagation model for Delhi, one way is to carry out measurement campaigns and how do I do the measurements? I go over 5 lambdas to 4 lambdas at a stretch moving radially away from the base station, average the power received and go and plotting it so and so forth till I get the curve. That will be my large scale propagation curve. The model that predict the mean signal strength for an arbitrary receive transmitter separation distance I also called large scale propagation models. Continuing with these large scale propagation models, the basic characteristics as opposed to the small scale propagation models are these work for large transmitter receiver separation distances, how large? Several hundreds to thousands of meters. So, we are really covering the whole cell. The main propagation mechanism is not scattering but reflections, though not too many reflections. The attenuation of signal strength due to power loss along the distance travelled is termed as shadowing. The distribution of power loss in dBs can be represented as log normal distributed. We will talk about log normal distribution towards the end of this lecture. So, we have to have something called as a log normal shadowing model for large scale propagation. There are small fluctuations around a slowly varying mean as opposed to rapid fluctuations around a slowly varying mean for small scale propagation models. This is useful in estimating the radio coverage of a transmitter and this will be actually used for your cell site planning. Now, let us look at large and small scale propagation models together. So, let me draw two axes. On the x axis, let me plot the large and the small scale variations in signal strength over time. So, suppose a mobile, a person sitting in a car talking on the mobile phone or holding a power meter is moving along the x axis. On the y axis, I would like to plot the signal strength, but in dB. So, these are much more smooth. So, on the top, I have plotted the large scale fading. The bottom diagram represents the small scale fading. Now, what is interesting is both have a slowly varying mean. But the variations in the small scale fading even in the mean is more than that you see in the large scale fading. Again, there are fluctuations about the mean for large scale, but these fluctuations become much more rapid for the small scale fading. If you look at the y axis, it is in dB and you can have the signal jump more than 10 to 20 dB because of the small scale model. So, here I have highlighted the mean of the large scale fading 
in red and that of the small scale fading in green. So, this clearly tells us that there are two distinct phenomena that is taking place and I will illustrate them with the case of an example and we will also look at how to model them separately. Suppose I have the received signal strength plotted in dv on the y axis and on the x axis again I make the mobile move with a power meter so that I can plot the signal strength. But these are very well averaged over 5 lambdas to 40 lambdas. So, I have got a neat path loss decay model. So, as we move away from the transmitter clearly in dB my signal strength drops. Now, what we would like to do is take a small section and go deeper into it and try to amplify and see what is actually going on. So, over and above this averaging thing, if we actually probe deeper inside, then I find really if you do not average, you have this slow fading, also called the long term fading. This is well rounded simply because I have plotted in, in dp. However, if I get more enthusiastic and curious, I would like to explore what is going on within a small section of this slow fading. So, if I go ahead and expand this further, I will see more variations than the slow fading is doing. Okay. So, that is your fast fading. So, fading itself can be subdivided into slow fading and fast fading. The actual mathematical definitions of slow fading and fast fading will be given at a later end. This is for your intuitive understanding. So, I have drawn two parallel lines. Now, let us look at the transmitter receiver separation along the x axis and these figures have been picked up from a typical measurement. So, look I am going only from 14 meter separation to 28 meter separation. Okay. So, barely 15 meters and here the received power is in dBm. So, with respect to a milliwatt, how much is the received strength of the thing. So, as the mobile moves away from the transmitter, clearly if you have the power meter, it will plot something like so, if I do this experiment, this is the actual measurement data that we will get okay, based on one random measurement taken. If you repeat this experiment, you will get something similar, but not exactly the same. These are clearly short term fading. And if you draw an average, in general the signal strength is dropping, but it is fluctuating rapidly across a mean. Now, let us understand where large scale and small scale propagation is coming into effect. What is so different? What makes large scale and small scale fading different to begin with? If we have that understanding, only then we can have an appropriate model. If we have an appropriate model, we can plan ourselves better. So, let us put on a patch of green a transmitter. And we have our first mobile, I make it move and for the sake of more realistic uh, scenario, I put a second mobile. Clearly, in real life environments, these mobiles will not be in the open field. There will be lot of reflectors, scatterers and diffracting edges around them. So, let us draw that. So, I have drawn here a shell which basically tells that there is a series of reflectors here, series of reflectors and scatterers here and there are some distant reflectors here. So, the signals going from the transmitter may either reach directly okay, or it may not have a direct path. So, it will go here, go through scattering and reach the reflector or it may reflect and reach 
through one or more reflections and scattering. So, you have reflections, you have scattering and further reflections here. But what is interesting is this area 1 and area 2 for the two mobile stations actually form the short term fading. The actual fluctuations, the rapid fluctuations which is leading to short term fading is coming from this local shells. Whereas, the long term fading is coming from key reflectors in the larger scheme of things. So, primarily long term fading comes from reflections whereas, short term fading is coming from scattering. We can take enough measurements and then do a curve fitting to come up with a model. The log distance path models have both theoretical and measurement based models that show that received signal power decreases logarithmically with distance. So, both analytically and by measurement you can find out that the decrease in power is logarithmic that is an important observation, because then we will have a log model. But this is not only true for outdoors, it is also true for indoors. This is amazing, this is an observation based on measurement that the signal power actually decreases logarithmically with distance. So, if we actually do measurements and plot let us look at the lower curve. On the x axis, I have distance, I have put a log scale here, and on the y axis, I have dB received power. Okay. Here, I get straight lines, it is actually decreasing logarithmically. If you do not take the log of the distance, if the distance is on the linear scale as depicted in the upper curve then the decay is logarithmic. Right? Now, what determines these three slopes is actually dictated by your environment. We will talk about what environment will get what kind of slope. These slopes are important because if the slope is larger, my cell size will be smaller. If my slopes are uh, the less, then I will have larger cell size. Fine? So, let us look at this log distance path loss model. The average large scale path loss for an arbitrarily transmitter receiver separation is expressed as a function of distance by using a path loss exponent n. We have come across this n earlier also, but here this is more based on measurements and empirical modeling n characterizes the propagation environment, for free space it is 2, whereas when we have more obstructions it can get a larger value. How large? It can have 3, 4, even up to 6, but larger the value of n, larger is the slope, larger is the decay. Question is, can we have n less than 2? Can we have n smaller than 2, which is obtained for free space propagation, we will soon see yes, we can have certain environments where n can be less than 2. So, let us look at the relationship. Please note on the left hand side, I have put path loss at a distance d, but a an average value. The bar over the p l denotes that it is the average value the average value is proportional to d over d naught raised to the power n, where n is the path loss exponent, d here is greater than d naught, d naught is one of the reference distances and in d b, the average path loss is nothing but average p l at d 0 plus 10 n log d over d 0. So, if we want to look at this equation in greater detail, P L D denotes the average <coughs> large scale path loss at a distance d. D 0 is the reference distance and 
this PL D0 is actually computed assuming free space propagation model between the transmitter and D0. Okay. So, there is a mix and match. While I am computing this D0, I have already either taken a measurement or calculated it using free space propagation. But in free space, we have to freeze n is equal to 2, whereas here I have n in the equation. So, it is a mix and match. We assume that at a close distance d0, you will nearly have line of sight. Once you have that, then you can use this equation with an n in your equation. Okay? This is a useful model. Now, let us look at some typical large scale path loss exponents for different environments. Free space we all know is 2, but in urban area cellular radio, it must increase because we have more obstructions and it goes from 2.5 to 3.5. Here I have written 2.7 to 3.5. It is all based on measurement data. So, for a city like Delhi, it can have a whole range of variations if in the cannot place downtown area, you can have close to 3.5, whereas in South De Delhi or in the suburbs, you can have close to 2.5. Shadowed urban cellular radio. Here, either you have a hilly terrain or a large building shadowing, wherein you are in the shadow of a building, it is much higher from 3 even up to 5. Where are you getting all this energy from? By scattering, by reflections, because clearly there is no line of sight when you talk about shadowing. You are in the shadow of a building. We will talk about this in building line of sight in a minute. If you are obstructed in a building, again no line of sight, you can have as large as 4 to 6, because there are really a lot of obstructions. The other interesting thing is the measurements done in this building are usually done at a lower uh, wavelength, higher frequency. What is misleading in this table is not all measurements have been done at the same frequency. And you must remember that scattering, reflection and diffraction effects are dependent on the wavelength. So, in that sense, it is slightly unfair to compare each one. But for a certain applications, for example, obstructed in building, I like to use my 2.4 gigahertz ISM band, I like to have 4 to 6 pass loss exponent in my model. If you are doing factories, which have much more uh, free space and less obstructions, you can go from 2 to 3. Now, look at this in building line of sight. It is interesting, it is less than 2, it is in fact from 1.6 to 1.8 what could be the reason? What could be better than free space? Well, firstly there is line of sight. So, I can at least have two. But then buildings and corridors in the buildings and rooms have a neat guiding effect. In free space, whatever energy which is radially transmitted out does not go directly to the receiver is lost. Whereas, in the buildings, if you are in a hallway or a corridor, there is a strong guiding effect and a lot of that energy also gets back. So, it is much better than 2. So, buildings, even sometimes streets, narrow streets will give you close to 2. Line of sight, narrow street propagation will also give you 1.8 or 1.9 as the path loss exponent. This is interesting. I can use this to my advantage. Now, let us look at something called log normal shadowing. The path loss equation for log distance model that we have already studied does not consider the fact that the surrounding environment may be vastly different at two locations. This is a key point. The surrounding environment may actually be very different at two different locations having the same transmit receive separation. The log normal equation that we have seen so far only depends on the distance. Remember 10 log 
d over d0 raised to the power m. It has nothing to do with the environment. This leads to measurements that are different than predicted average values obtained using the equations shown before. Measurements show that for any value d, the path loss PL of d in dBm at a location is randomly distributed log normally. So, let us go back to our equation. Something is wrong here. What is wrong? Well, what was typically measured and predicted was that the average path loss is only a function of d, the transmitter receiver separation and the path loss exponent n. n happily takes care of the environment, d the transmitter receiver separation. But the environment may be different. In fact, there has to be randomness. There has to be a, a difference between scenario 1 and scenario 2. I need to put in some component of randomness which will encompass the various situations. Sometimes this equation will hold good, sometimes this path loss predicted will be slightly less, sometimes it will be slightly more. So, what was found that if you take actual measurements, in general it might hold, but in reality measurements showed that for any value d here, the path loss is actually a distribution. And what kind of a distribution? They did a curve fitting and they found it was log normal. So, if you represent the receive strength in logarithms, that is in dB scale, the distribution is normal, Gaussian distribution. Right? That is a very interesting thing. It can also be proven analytically by using the a central limit theorem. So, what is this log normal shadowing that has cropped up at the last minute? Well, it has been proposed to take into account the shadowing effects due to cluttering on the propagation path. Okay. So, what is it? Well, we add a factor as follows. P L D in D B is P L D plus a correction factor. Now, this correction factor is distributed log normally. So, in general we are ok, we are not too bad, but we need a correction factor, but this correction factor is not a constant, it is a random variable. So, if you put it more clearly in terms of a d naught, a reference measure distance, p l bar d is nothing but p l bar d 0 plus 10 n log d over d 0, where n is the path loss exponent. Question? Sir, is there any range for the correction factor? Yes. The question being asked is, what is the range for a correction factor? Clearly, this is normally distributed, Gaussian distribution. So, it actually stretches from minus infinity to plus infinity, but we will truncate it. Otherwise, you will have negative path loss. We cannot have more signal received than we transmit it. Right. So, we will give that as an example. So, it is really a correction factor, but a truncated log normal. So, let us look at this in slightly more detail. So, what is this x sigma? x sigma is a 0 mean Gaussian, which we are talking about as normal distributed random variable in dB again with a standard deviation sigma, which is also in dB. So, let us focus on this x sigma. Okay. That is the randomness added into your path loss equation. Now, what determines the sigma? Well, you can get it from measurements okay, or even analytically. So, in practice, n and sigma are calculated from measured data. If I have this value, then I can actually predict what could be my received signal strength. What is the received signal strength? Received signal strength is nothing but the signal strength transmitted minus the path loss if I am talking in dB. 
So, PR which is the received signal strength in dBm is nothing but the transmitted power in dBm minus the path loss. If you want to explicitly write PRD the received power in dBm is nothing but the transmitted power in dBm minus PLD0 dB minus 10 n log d over d 0 plus x sigma n dB. Okay. Question being asked is why is the path loss in dB? Well, it is clearly giving you a relative location with respect to d0. Okay. So, you have certain dBm subtraction starting from dBm and then this equation which will give you a dBm relationship. You can equivalently write this thing in parenthesis in terms of dBm as well. So, received power, transmit power, path loss have a very simple equations, but what is interesting to note is that this path loss itself has the antenna gains included in them. Earlier we had used antenna gains G T and G R as unity and if you want to explicitly write it out, those things will affect here. So, let us look at this log normal shadowing. The result of a path loss is log normal shadowing which is given by PLD and the log normal distribution has a PDF given by P of m is equal to 1 over under root 2 pi sigma e raise power minus m minus m bar whole square over 2 sigma squared. It is the normal distribution with variance sigma squared. Here m is the true received signal level m in dB that is 10 log to the base 10 m. m bar is given by the area average of the signal level that is mean of m and sigma is the standard deviation in dB. So, let us see what is this equation. In log normal shadowing environments, the PLD, the path loss and PRD at a distance d are normally distributed in dB, about a distance dependent mean with a standard deviation sigma. Right. How does the log normal distribution look? Well, here I have conveniently truncated it, but on this axis is your m it is around an average value m bar, this is the sigma, this is your log normal distribution, the PDF of the received signal level in dB. What is determining your m bar? Well, this actually is determined by your distance and the path loss exponent and about this distance you are distributed. So, this can be effectively used to model path loss and come up with certain uh, cell site planning systems. So, at this point let us conclude and summarize what we have learnt today. We took a deeper look into the free space propagation model. We looked at the different components, the d squared part and the L. Then we introduce the notion of small scale propagation model followed by the large scale propagation model. We understood why they happen, how are they different. Then we looked at the log distance path loss model. It is based on measurement data and then we realize that this does not work for all environments. We have to do something about it. We have to add a random correction factor and that led us to the log normal shadowing. Now, there is more to log normal shadowing and we will start off with log normal shadowing in the next lecture.